All right, thank you, Jim, uh, and welcome everyone to this event. Um, I am Joe Bast. I'm the president of the Heartland Institute. Uh, the Heartland Institute is 32 years old now. I co-founded it back in 1984. We were downtown Chicago until just uh, about 14 months ago when we moved out here to Arlington Heights. This event is taking place in the Andrew Breitbart Freedom Center. We're very pleased to have been able to uh, get the family to agree to allow us to use Andrew's name on this space. Uh, it reflects the Heartland Institute's interest in free market ideas. We're a conservative slash libertarian think tank. We're interested in finding solutions to social and economic problems that involve more freedom and less government. We're here tonight. <laughs> And we moved to the northwest suburbs to get applause for a line like that <laughs> because we never got that in downtown Chicago, I can tell you. Uh, we're here to witness something that's really rare, uh, which is a debate on the causes and consequences of global warming. Uh, we have two experts with us. Uh, the first is Scott Denning. I've got his bio here. Scott is a professor of atmospheric science at Colorado State University. He received his PhD and master's degree in atmospheric science from Colorado State University at Fort Collins and a bachelor of science degree in geological science from the University of Maine in Orano. Uh, Scott has debated various people on climate change, uh, including several or two, I believe, at our conferences, conferences at the Heartland Institute hosts on climate change. Um, international conferences. Um, he is going to be debating Jay Lair. Dr. Jay Lair is the Heartland Institute Science Director. <clears throat> Jay is the author of uh, some 30 books, most recently the Energy Encyclopedia, um, the uh, Water Encyclopedia, and uh, I'll go back a few years, Rational Readings on Environmental Concerns, which was the first book of Jay's that uh, came to my attention. Um, Jay got his PhD in water hydrology from the University of Arizona, and he got his uh, bachelor's of science in geological engineering from Princeton University at the ripe old age of 20. Um, precocious. Some of us peak early. Um, <laughs> But Jay <laughs> shows no signs of having peaked yet, so I think it's going to be great. I've been told that uh, the Heartland Institute's most recent book on this subject, Why Scientists Disagree About Global Warming, is available at a special price of $10 a copy tonight. So if you would like to buy a copy, uh, they're going to be available so somewhere in this room. Um, this book is actually one chapter of a much larger book that's in production, Climate Change Reconsidered part two, the benefits and costs of fossil fuels. That's going to be a 13 chapter, 1300 page book. So we decided just to publish one chapter of it that looks specifically at the claim of scientific consensus on the climate issue. Uh, so if you're interested in the issue, I hope you'll buy a copy. Buy one for your son, buy one for your daughter uh, and your son-in-law and everybody else who might disagree with you on climate change. Okay. Yeah, and for their professors. Um, the format for the debate tonight is going to be a series of alternating five-minute presentations by these two guys. And we've got, I believe, six clips from Al Gore's movie, An Inconvenient Truth. Uh, this is the tenth, this year is the tenth anniversary of the release of that movie. So we are going to ask how well has that movie stood up to criticism and over time. Uh, Dr. Lair doesn't think it stood up very well. Dr. Denning thinks it has stood up pretty well uh, against the test of time. So without further ado, let me introduce to you our first speaker tonight, Dr. Scott Denning. Well, thanks very much for, uh, for having me. And uh, I guess we each get about five minutes to, uh, to open, and then we'll start looking at these, uh, at these clips. Um, I watched this movie 10 years ago, uh, not in the theaters, but on Netflix when it became, became available. And uh, I kind of mixed feelings about it at the time. And it's been 10 years, you know, a long time. I, I had forgotten a, a lot about 
uh, what was in this movie. So um, to prepare for tonight, uh, both Jay and I watched it again um, in the last couple of weeks. And um, I was surprised, actually. The, the movie has, uh, is not exactly as I remembered it. I think it's actually aged pretty well as a piece of pop culture, you know, won, won an Academy Award and all this kind of stuff. Um, not really my uh, go-to source for climate science communication, but my disagreements with the movie are mostly on matters of emphasis uh, rather than accuracy. The way I prefer to talk about climate change, I call the three S's of climate change. So it's easy to remember, three words, they all start with the letter S. Simple, serious, solvable, the three S's of climate change. Now, simple is kind of a weird thing for me to say because I've been working on this for like 25 years and um, have all these graduate students studying it and so forth. Uh, but really the basic story of climate change we'll see in the first clip is stuff that you learned in grade school. It's uh, very straightforward. Um, science, heat in minus heat out equals change of heat. Uh, same kind of principle as uh, heating up a pot of water on the stove. You put heat into the water, it changes its temperature. Same thing happens for the earth. Um, it's also serious, so simple serious. Um, less than 10% of the fossil fuels in the ground have been burned up to now. So 10%, 10 give, or, give or take, rough figure. And the question really isn't about uh, how much climate change has happened up to now but whether we ought to burn the other 90% of the fossil fuel. So 10 times the amount of fossil fuel that has been burned up to now, should we or shouldn't we? Um, without some kind of policy around that, uh, economists have estimated that burning the uh, 10 times more fossil fuel than we've burned now will cost uh, roughly 25% reduction in the size of the economy by 2100. So, uh, you, you know, think about the Great Recession back in 08, 09. It's about a 5% hit on GDP. I uh, think about five times that kind of hit. Um, and that's a, a pretty substantial hit. Uh, and that's 100 years out. So, you know, economy is much bigger by then. So 25% of a very large number. But we're lucky that this is a solvable problem. Won't be that hard to solve. Not even all that expensive to solve. We know exactly what to do. Uh, we already have the technology we need to produce abundant energy for our growing economy without burning 10 times more fossil fuel. Some people think our modern lifestyle is a house of cards, that it's propped up by stuff we dig out of the ground. Uh, some people think free markets and free people are weak and unable to solve this problem. Uh, I, I think that's, that's unfortunate. That's a very dire and, and negative way to look at, at uh, history and, and our world. I prefer to think that uh, the lifestyle we enjoy comes from, from us, comes from ingenuity, comes from creativity, comes from hard work. What we need to solve this problem is faith in ourselves, faith in progress, the courage to pursue market-based solutions. Thanks. I've been hanging out around Heartland for uh, about uh, 20 years. I'm kind of a mild-mannered person. Joe doesn't remember me being here then. But uh, it's been a long and uh, wonderful relationship. Uh, Scott Denning and I have debated before. We uh, debated before the uh, Colorado Senate in, uh, in February. We've debated on the radio. Uh, I don't think I've ever had more respect or friendship or enjoyment of an individual with whom I disagree totally than uh, with, with Scott. <laughs> and uh, so pretty much uh, everything he'll say tonight I'll disagree with and try to give you uh, uh, reasons for it. And maybe some of you will reach uh, new conclusions or the same conclusions you have. But I want to uh, uh, go over the movie. did win an Academy Award. It should have won an Academy Award for uh, fear-mongering. It's certainly one of the greatest fear-mongering uh, movies around. There are others. Uh, Gasland is one of my, uh, my favorites. Uh, but in watching it again, as uh, Scott did, uh, something amazing occurred to me, which you might see in the film clips, is that uh, Al Gore, I think, could have made an honest living as a narrator. He's really quite good. He chose to go in a different direction. But uh, he definitely adds positively to the movie. Uh, he's now made, I think, over $400 million uh, promoting uh, global warming. Uh, I want to 
I want to go over four uh, questions with you right now in the few minutes I have. Uh, is the Earth warming? Is warming bad? Is carbon dioxide bad? Is carbon dioxide uh, causing uh, warming? Well, the Earth uh, has warmed uh, since the Little Ice Age ended around the uh, 13th uh, century. Uh, and we warmed up, and the, the Little Ice Age uh, hit its peak when uh, Washington was at Valley Forge. And it's warmed since then, since the mid-19th, uh, 18th century. Uh, it stopped warming about uh, 18 or 20 uh, years ago. Uh, we have seen no warming in the last, uh, <coughs> the last 18 uh, years. Is warming bad? We go south for vacation. Uh, crops, the growing season uh, increases. Uh, five times more people die prematurely from cold uh, than from warm. And uh, actually, we have fairly good temperature records on the Earth for the last 5,000 years with a number of proxies. And right now, the temperature of the Earth is uh, below the average of the last uh, 5,000 years. So I would say uh, warming is not bad. Is carbon dioxide bad? We live on this planet because of carbon dioxide. And up until World War II, we were perilously close to the minimum limit on carbon dioxide, uh, which for life on Earth is 150 parts per million. You go below 150 ppm, and plants die. Plants die, animals die, and we die. We are very fortunate to be on a planet with carbon dioxide. Since World War II, because of automobiles, because of factories and power plants, we've increased carbon dioxide to 400 parts per million. I wish somebody in this room had a, uh, an instrument that would measure the carbon dioxide in this room because I'd be willing to bet anybody a significant amount of money that it's uh, about 2,000 in this room because you're all exhaling carbon dioxide. In the Navy, submarines, they try to limit the carbon dioxide to about 5,000. The point being there are no medical problems with a high carbon dioxide. When the dinosaurs walked the Earth, there were 1,800 parts per million carbon dioxide in the air. Lush vegetation, as most of you remember studying, that was 550 million years ago. Uh, the carbon dioxide uh, is wonderful. It is not uh, hurting us in any way. And is it causing the planet's temperature to change? Absolutely not. There is no evidence whatsoever that anything man is doing is measurably altering the temperature of the planet. The only thing they have are mathematical equations that they gin up. There are more variables in what determines our climate than any computer on Earth can really handle. So they limit the variables in their equations to ones they think they have a feel for, although it will surprise you that we really do not understand the impact that clouds have. Scott is more expert on, on clouds than I. I think he'll at least partially agree we don't have a total handle on clouds, and they are very important. We, we don't give the sun much credit in the temperature of the Earth, which kind of shocks me. But we have no real evidence. These mathematical models have failed to be able to predict what the temperature of the planet was 10 years ago when we have all the data. And none of the models have predicted that we would have little warming in the last 18 years. So they're really not of very much value. The evidence we do have we have ice cores that go back 900,000 years around Greenland and the Arctic. And in these ice cores, we can measure what the temperature was when the ice was frozen, how much carbon dioxide was in the ice bubbles, and how old it is through carbon dating. And we find there are 1,500-year cycles of the temperature of the Earth going up and coming down. And one of the amazing things is that the, the heat goes up before the carbon dioxide. The heating of the planet in these 1,500-year cycles leads the increase in carbon dioxide by a number of centuries, which is logical, 
because the oceans control, contain most of the carbon dioxide, and when they're warmed, then the carbon comes out. So the carbon dioxide doesn't cause warming, it follows warmings. So I hope in the next less than an hour now, as we go through these film clips, uh, I can convince you, uh, in opposition to uh, Scott, that we don't have to solve the man-caused global warming problem because it doesn't exist. Thank you. Well, the sun's radiation comes in in the form of light waves, and that heats up the Earth. And then some of the radiation that is absorbed and warms the Earth is re-radiated back into space in the form of infrared radiation. And some of the outgoing infrared radiation is trapped by this layer of atmosphere and held inside the atmosphere. And that's a good thing because it keeps the temperature of the Earth within certain boundaries, keeps it relatively constant and livable. But the problem is this thin layer of atmosphere is being thickened by all of the global warming pollution that's being put up there. And what that does is it thickens this layer of atmosphere, more of the outgoing infrared is trapped. And so the atmosphere heats up worldwide. That's global warming. So um, this basic little snippet about global warming. Um, heat in minus heat out equals change of heat. You put more heat in than goes out, it warms up. You take more heat out than goes in, it cools off. Uh, this is the reason why day is warmer than night. More heat in than goes out. It's the reason why summer's warmer than winter. More heat in than goes out. It's why Miami is warmer than Minneapolis. And this is not mysterious. These are, these are very uh, well understood phenomena. Uh, the, the first measurements, not really from models or equations that are cooked up, as, as Jay said, but measurements in a laboratory of the absorption of heat by CO2 were made in 1863 when Abraham Lincoln was president. Uh, since that time, of course, they've been made thousands of times around the world by lots and lots of scientists with better and better and better instruments. We all get exactly the same uh, numbers for those. I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember these. This is an incandescent light bulb. Uh, this one happens to be a four-watt light bulb that, uh, you know, back when I was a boy, they were Christmas tree lights. And when my kids were little, we used them as night lights so they could find the bathroom at night. Four watts is the amount of heat that's absorbed if you double uh, the amount of CO2 molecules up in the sky. Um, and I know that Dr. Lair says it's uh, climate's complicated. We don't understand it's unpredictable. CO2 photons are somehow different than sunshine photons. But, but really, physics has proved that wrong time and time again. Every single year, the, the summer, on average, is warmer than the winter. Every single year, Miami is, on average, warmer than Minneapolis for precisely the same reason. Heat in minus heat out equals change of heat. We measure the change of heat with the CO2 in the laboratory. Scott has left out a critically important aspect of CO2 absorption uh, of the sun's radiation absorbed by the Earth and then re-radiated back. Carbon dioxide uh, molecule, one carbon, uh, two oxygens, uh, vibrate and absorbs uh, radiation as he explained and as the movie shows. However, it will only absorb radiation uh, in a certain wavelength. That wavelength is uh, essentially averages 15 microns. That's a, a, a very tiny, tiny uh, number, like 10 to the minus 17th. And so there's only a limited amount of that wavelength of total radiation that carbon dioxide can absorb. And it's 90% full. In other words, the carbon dioxide in our atmosphere is 90% full of the radiation it can absorb. So increasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere will have absolutely no effect in keeping more heat in. In fact, if we double the amount of carbon dioxide uh, in the coming <coughs> decades, and we probably will, it'll have no uh, measurable impact at all. The other part is that 95% at least of greenhouse gas is water vapor. Carbon dioxide is a, a very small part, 4 or 5% uh, that's being blamed for uh, what is supposed to be a dramatic uh, change in the temperature of the planet. And of that carbon dioxide 
97% is contributed by the oceans and decaying vegetation, giving back the carbon dioxide it absorbed in its life uh, process. Only 3% of the carbon dioxide that is, that's in the atmosphere actually came uh, from man. And so our part of the whole thing is 3% times 4% or 12 thousandths of a percent. And it's that tiny amount that they want us to change the economy of the entire world in order to stop by eliminating fossil fuels. And, and that is in, indeed, and, and Scott alluded to it, that's really what this is all about, is getting rid of fossil fuels. We'll talk more about that later. We're now going to show you a clip about coral reefs. Coral reefs all over the world, because of global warming and other factors, are bleaching, and they end up like this. And all the fish species that depend on the coral reefs are also in jeopardy as a result. Overall, species loss is now occurring at a rate 1,000 times greater than the natural background rate. Well, Mr. Gore knows nothing about coral bleaching. Carl, uh, the, as did the people who, in Hollywood who made the, the film, because uh, coral bleaching is a natural uh, phenomenon. Uh, algae live within coral, and the algae actually give the coral their normal color. Any environmental change whatsoever, a coral species will leave the reef, the reef will look whiter than it did before, a new species of coral will move in, and the coral again will become a, a normal color. And so the, the whole fear-mongering of the coral bleaching uh, was basically uh, addressed at the Great Barrier Reef, a thousand miles uh, long off the coast of uh, Australia, at a point where there had been a major environmental change. There was a change in the algae, and it appeared that some of it had whitened. There have now been underwater surveys done on the Great Barrier Reef recently by two scientists in New Zealand across, across the whole thousand miles of the reef. And they find it is thriving. There is, there is no problem. There is no more bleaching than there was 20 years ago when a similar survey uh, was made. So the whole fear-mongering of the coral bleaching was false, fraudulent. What it did was it had a, a terrible negative impact on a $5 billion tourism industry along the Great Barrier Reef uh, in Australia for a problem that never existed. Well, that's an interesting uh, story about the Great Barrier Reef. I went to the Great Barrier Reef a few, well, must, must be 15 years ago now and went uh, snorkeling there, Remar remarkable place, 1,000 miles of coral. Um, just a few months ago, uh, the biggest coral bleaching uh, episode in history happened on the Great Barrier Reef, uh, especially in the northern end away from the cities in the most uh, s sort of out of the way part of the, of the reef where um, uh, there are, there's less boats and, and uh, divers and so forth. About a third of that uh, coral reef is now um, bleached now in, in uh, this month, not, not uh, perhaps years ago, but um, it will be much, much worse in the future, both because of the heat uh, from the extra CO2 and because the dissolved CO2 in the ocean acidifies the water so that it's uh, not favorable for precipitating the calcium carbonate that the reef is made of. Uh, but the biggest damage really that we're concerned about with global warming, and this is sort of my uh, complaint about emphasis in the movie, isn't really about coral reefs, it's about the economy. Uh, every economist that's ever run the numbers on, uh, on this uh, can, can come up with estimates of what does it cost to do various uh, forms of energy. Um, replacing fossil fuels in our economy over the next couple of human generations will probably reduce global GDP by about 1%, 1% of GDP, which is a lot of money. But that's only a, that, that's a drop in the bucket compared to 25% reduction in the size of the world economy if we burn 10 times more fossil fuels than we have today. So it's not really about coral bleaching. It's about your retirement account. It's about your 401k. It's about your kids being able to get jobs. Oh, my turn again. 
So uh, let's keep this show Go. what happens to the crevasses, and when lakes form, they create what are called moulins. The water goes down to the bottom and it lubricates where the ice meets the bedrock. See these people here for scale? This is not on the edge of Greenland. This is in the middle of the ice mass. This is a massive rushing torrent of fresh meltwater tunneling straight down through the Greenland ice to the bedrock below. Now, to some extent, there has always been seasonal melting and moulins have formed in the past, but not like now. In 1992, they measured this amount of melting in Greenland. Ten years later, this is what happened. And here's the melting from 2005. Tony Blair's scientific advisor has said that because of what's happening in Greenland right now, the maps of the world will have to be redrawn. If Greenland broke up and melted, or if half of Greenland and half of West Antarctica broke up and melted, this is what would happen to the sea level in Florida. This is what would happen to San Francisco Bay. A lot of people live in these areas. The Netherlands, one of the low countries, absolutely devastating. The area around Beijing that's home to tens of millions of people. Even worse, in the area around Shanghai, there are 40 million people. Worse still, Calcutta and to the east, Bangladesh, the area covered includes 60 million people. Think of the impact of a couple hundred thousand refugees when they're displaced by an environmental event. And then imagine the impact of a hundred million or more. So uh, the sea level issue with the ice has gotten quite a bit worse since the movie came out. Uh, this year, 2016, the amount of meltwater on the surface of Greenland is about twice what you saw there uh, in the movie from 2006, from, from 10 years ago when the movie came out. Um, the Burning a fossil fuel adds uh, CO2 to the atmosphere, which absorbs heat. The proposal uh, is to burn 10 times as much fossil fuel as we have yet burned. That will add more heat in two centuries than was added over 100 centuries when we came out of the last ice age. Not the little ice age that Jay talked about, but the big one. Starting 12,000 years ago, no, sorry, 12,000 BC. 12,000 BC, as that ice was melting, the oceans rose a foot every decade for 400 years, for 40 feet in 400 years. That's the last time that a lot of ice melted on this planet. So it can melt fast, and it can melt big, and it can raise seas quite a lot. The creeping blue stain that you see on these maps uh, is kind of the least of the problems with sea level rise. The big problem is that when storms come, they come from a higher level to start with, and so you get uh, crossing of, of thresholds much, much earlier. It happens decades before the, the big blue stain. That will cause tens of trillions of dollars in property loss and create a um, hundred times as many climate refugees as the number of refugees that we've seen in the last couple of years coming out of Syria. And you know what the millions of refugees out of Syria have done uh, to Europe and to, to um, our ability to, to deal with that crisis. Imagine uh, a very, very much larger number of, of refugees coming out of these, uh, these flooded places. I think most people will agree that that last film clip, wa clip was fear-mongering at its worst. I mean, really showing parts of the United States uh, drowning. Let's go back to Greenland. Uh, Greenland has never been totally green, but between the year 1000 and 1250, we had a uh, medieval uh, warming period where there was farming on uh, Greenland. The uh, archaeologists have proven that they grew corn there, they grew barley there, and they even find uh, reserves of coal there, meaning that uh, Greenland has definitely had different uh, climates over the years and has not dramatically uh, altered 
the level of the ocean. The uh, National Oceanographic Survey has gauges uh, all over the oceans, and we know that uh, the ocean level is indeed rising. It's been rising for the last 800 years of record, and it's rising at a fairly constant rate of 2.32 millimeters a year, which adds up to eight inches per century. And so the idea of showing films drowning areas and, and climate refugees is uh, borderline disgraceful in terms of the fraud. And, and Scott is constantly reiterating the loss to the economy of burning more fossil fuel. Well, the world's economy has already lost over a trillion dollars uh, trying to promote solar energy and wind energy and reduce fossil fuels because they're more costly. And there are over a billion people in the world that do not have electricity, they do not have sanitation or good water supplies that that money uh, could have been spent on. So uh, I will make the same claims that it is the global warming fraud that is having a tremendously negative impact uh, on the economy of the entire world. Let's look at the next clip when uh, Mr. Gore, again, a brilliant narrator, begins to talk about polar bears. That's not good for creatures like polar bears who depend on the ice. A new scientific study shows that for the first time they're finding polar bears that have actually drowned, swimming long distances, up to 60 miles to find the ice. And they didn't find that before. But what does it mean to us to look at a vast expanse of open water at the top of our world that used to be covered by ice. The polar bear was a poor choice of uh, being the cuddly little icon for uh, global warming. First of all, we know that a polar bear at times can swim 100 miles, and we know they're increasing dramatically. First of all, we now know they've been around for 500,000 years, and goodness knows there have been a lot of warming and cooling cycles during that period, and they've thrived. We know they're increasing. There are 19 families of polar bears, 13 of them in Canada. Uh, Two-thirds of them are growing, a few are stable, and a couple are declining. And interestingly, the couple families that are declining are in the coldest parts of Canada. We're not sure. There are studies indicating, and, and Scott has told me this was a Russian study uh, not to be believed, and he may be right, that in the 60s, they estimated that we had about 5,000 uh, polar bears in the Arctic and Canadian area. We now know for sure we have 25,000, and we really have visual evidence of their increase. In uh, Churchill, Manitoba, uh, at least uh, right on the edge of Hudson Bay, at least 10,000 visitors every year come to watch uh, these polar bears eat, feed, and, and do whatever, and we know over the last 10 years, the numbers of polar bears coming into Churchill have increased every year. The number one scientist in the world, Mitchell Taylor, has been studying uh, polar bears in Canada for uh, 21 years. He has 50 peer-reviewed publications, and he has tremendous evidence of the increasing health of the polar bear area. Uh, he has been disinvited from conferences in his own area because of this, because uh, the standard mantra of uh, global warming people is that uh, the polar bears are uh, endangered when indeed they are not. There really aren't any credible scientists left that believe that the polar bears are in any danger from uh, global warming, man-caused, or otherwise. Well, I'm reminded of the doctor in the original Star Trek that was always saying, damn it, Jim, I'm a doctor, not a, you know, fill in the blank, because I'm an atmospheric scientist, not a polar bear specialist. Um, I do know that uh, Churchill, Manitoba is, uh, is a place where people go to watch the polar bears. They come into town to eat uh, at the landfill there. Um, and there may be more polar bears at that landfill than there used to be. Um, I think that the point uh, 
that, uh, that I take away from this clip is that polar bears interact with the ice, they hunt on the ice, and as the ice melts, uh, there's less and less habitat for polar bears. Um, there's about a third less ice in the Arctic in late summer now, right, right now, uh, than there was 30, 40, 50 years ago. So uh, as the ice has decreased, there's less and less habitat for polar bears. But climate change isn't mostly about polar bears. Uh, climate change is about um, burning 10 times as much fossil fuel as we've burned to date. So looking at, at something like a tenfold increase in effects. And uh, lost economic growth, your 401k, your kids' jobs, prospects, and so forth. But polar bears kind of a, a side issue. We have another clip. Ultimately, this question comes down to this. Are we capable of rising above ourselves and above history? Well, the record indicates that we do have that capacity. We established freedom and self-determination in the United States and in France and then all over the world. The same year Lincoln freed America's slaves, Russia freed its serfs. Women earned the right to vote, first in New Zealand, then in Scandinavia, and it spread from there. The entire world defeated fascism in both Europe and the Pacific simultaneously. The moral force for nonviolence triggered a revolution that spread to other countries. The world supported Nelson Mandela's victory in tearing down the apartheid system. Scientists and doctors from many nations worked together to conquer fearsome diseases like smallpox and polio. And the two superpowers finally ended their deadly nuclear arms race. We landed on the moon, the very example of what's possible when we are at our best. We worked together to bring down communism. We have even solved a global environmental crisis before. The hole in the stratospheric ozone layer. So. Uh, we're lucky that um, this problem is not as big of a problem as some of the problems that our forefathers have solved. Uh, we know exactly how to do it from a scientific point of view, from an engineering point of view, even from an economic point of view. This is not the, the killer problem that, uh, that Jay has made it out to be. And, and it's not a, a terribly expensive problem to solve. Far cheaper to solve it than to fail to solve it. Most economists estimate changing the energy system would re reduce growth in GDP over the century by about 1% compared to a 25% loss if we don't solve it. Sometimes we need policies. For example, we support our military, the greatest military in the world, to the tune of $600 billion a year. We together build roads and bridges and highways that allow us to drive our cars. What would our cars be worth if you had to build your own road to get to Chicago? When, when our, my grandparents were on this earth, uh, their generation ripped up every street in New York and London and Paris and laid sewer pipes and brought in city water, ran hot and cold running water up and down tenements, knocked out walls and, and put in toilets and uh, showers and bathtubs, and boy, was that worth it. When my parents uh, were making decisions, their policies built the interstate highway systems. My own generation has built the internet, has, has replaced landline phones with a mobile, a mobile phone uh, system that has transformed our lives. We didn't go broke doing these things. We did very well for ourselves. And now our kids get to do it again. I love when Scott talks economics because no one will quarrel with the fact that the world has collectively spent well over a trillion dollars to attempt to uh, reduce carbon dioxide in our atmosphere and the net result has been uh, zero. Uh, it is actually, in fact, we in France are about the only countries that actually have reduced their carbon dioxide uh, outputs, France because they're mostly nuclear power and uh, we because we've uh, put scrubbers on our uh, smokestacks and improve the way we uh, burn coal and certainly reduced emissions from our uh, our cars but uh, his economic argument is is virtually the opposite 
That film clip is uh, an incredible example of a non sequitur. There was nothing in the film clip that has anything to do with global warming or the technical ways that we may try to eliminate uh, global warming if it were uh, occurring. It just shows that as a, a nation, we are capable of doing uh, a great many great things, and I totally agree. But the whole global warming issue is just part of a long history of uh, fear-mongering that does not come true. You will all remember that Earth Day started around 1970 when uh, talk about uh, predicting the worst. Paul Ehrlich, a Stanford biologist, predicted that there would be uh, millions of people uh, starving throughout the world, that the oceans were going to go bad. Uh, David Brower ran the Sierra Club, uh, felt that overpopulation was destroying the planet, and he recommended to the United States government that uh, you have to get a license to uh, have a child, never uh, always realizing or never realizing that uh, the greatest resource we have is people and that is what is between uh, their ears. So we've had one doomsday after another. Uh, none of them ever happened. They predicted that we'd have no more oil reserves by the year 2000. We are swimming uh, in uh, shale gas and, and oil. This, that film clip is just an example of, of fear-mongering uh, taken at, at a different picture, showing what we could do if there was a problem. There is no problem. And in fact, if there were, the efforts that we've put forth in the last 30 years to eliminate carbon dioxide have not come to uh, fruition at all. Well, let's look at another one of the uh, huge mistakes in this movie and it deals with uh, a famous mountain you're all familiar with, uh, Mount Kilimanjaro. This is Mount Kilimanjaro more than 30 years ago and more recently. And a friend of mine just came back from Kilimanjaro with a picture he took a couple months ago. Well, the picture is correct. The uh, glacier that was on Mount Kilimanjaro uh, was built 11,000 years ago. Kilimanjaro is 19,340 feet high. It was first summited in the year 1889. And when it was summited, it had lost a great deal of its ice. It has been losing its ice for over a century, long, long before man started pumping a great deal of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere from cars, power plants, and, and factories. And the interesting thing about the, the total inaccuracy of that clip, or Mr. Gore not understanding it, is the temperature on the top of Mount Kilimanjaro has never, ever risen above freezing. Not ever. There has never been any melting. Well, how come all the ice is gone? Well, I'll teach you a little bit of physics. Uh, it's called sublimation. When ice goes directly from a solid to a gas, it's called sublimation. And the reason the glacier has disappeared off Kilimanjaro, and the picture is accurate, is that deforestation has occurred over the century at the base of the 19,000-foot uh, mountain, and dry air rises up the mountain and uh, causes the ice to go from solid uh, to gaseous. And so they're, they're, it's, uh, it's an, like the polar bear is a poor icon for global warming. Uh, Kilimanjaro uh, could not be a worse uh, example. So of course, it's not just uh, Mount Kilimanjaro. It's every mountain range in the world. Um, I'm from Colorado. Uh, in the western U.S., 70 million people get our water from mountain snows. Uh, we use that water for our cities, for our suburbs, for our farms, for our ranches. They uh, water our forests. In Colorado, uh, where I'm particularly familiar with the data, the snowpack, uh, late spring snowpack, is down 20% just since 1980. 20%. Uh, there's only been about one degree Fahrenheit of warming, half a degree Celsius of warming, 20% reduction in the snow. The melt is coming three weeks earlier on average than it did 35 years ago. Uh, burning 10 times more fossil fuel than we've burned yet um, will add as much heat in, in just two centuries as was added 
uh, over a hundred centuries coming out of the Little Ice Age, uh, sorry, out of the, uh, the Big Ice Age, the, the 18,000 year ago Ice Age. If physics works now, just like it did back then, uh, that'll be 10 degrees Fahrenheit of warming in the middle of North America, not the one degree Fahrenheit of warming that we've had up to now. Uh, that, that's a heck of a lot of warming for a place that gets its water out of snow, and I'm talking the US, not, not Kilimanjaro. Uh, the cost of failure to solve this problem is, is extremely high. We need free market solutions or policy will be driven instead by panic. So I want to remind you about my three S's. The three S's of climate change, simple, serious, and solvable. Jay says that the heat from burning 10 times more fossil fuel won't change the Earth's temperature. Uh, but he can't really explain why not, right? Heat in minus heat out equals change of heat. Every time heat is added to the Earth's surface, it warms up. It's not all that mysterious. Uh, this is, as I said, why day is warmer than night, why summer is warmer than winter, why Miami is warmer than Minneapolis. If you burn um, 10 times more fossil fuel, you won't just have that one light bulb from doubling CO2. You have two light bulbs on every square meter of the planet uh, that much extra heat, um, pretty much in perpetuity. At the end of the last ice age, that was six and a half watts, so we're talking about more than that amount of heat. Um, and at that, that time, when the uh, six and a half watts was added to the world for 100 centuries, the seas rose hundreds of feet. So it's not uh, it's like this hasn't happened before. Uh, the Little Ice Age, the medieval warming period, all of these previous climate changes have shown that when heat is added to the world, it warms up. Not all that hard to understand. Uh, solving this problem will cost our kids a hundred times less than not solving it. We need your wisdom. We need your ideas. The public policy debate about climate change needs the free market solutions that your community can bring. Heartland is a free market think tank, and if groups like Heartland don't engage in promoting and leading in free market solutions to this problem, the policy solutions for this problem will certainly be written by the left. There is a leadership vacuum on the right in providing proper free market solutions to this problem, and in the long run, that will do more damage to freedom and to free markets than all of the, the leftist uh, movements in the last century. There's no need to fear this problem. The market system is not weak. We are not a weak society. We are not a weak civilization. We need to be brave. We need to embrace the future. We need to look towards the 21st century with 21st century free market solutions, not back to the 19th century with technologies that were appropriate for our great grandparents. Civilization is not a house of cards propped up by stuff that we dig out of the ground. It comes from inside us. It comes from the sweat of our brows and the sparks in our souls. And as long as our kids can be as creative and as hardworking as our ancestors were, they're going to be okay. Thank you for your time. It's hard for me to believe I can like someone so much who I so totally disagree with. <laughs> Global warming uh, was, was not an environmental problem uh, adopted by the public and by the politicians. Uh, it was an idea of environmental zealots and politicians who saw an opportunity to gain uh, power uh, and control over society. They had tried global cooling, as most of you may remember, back in the 70s, mid-70s, every major news publication, U.S. News and World Report, Time Magazine, and Newsweek, had covers of... Uh, scarily showing the next glacier coming down on uh, society. Somehow that scare didn't work, and they uh, 
reversed course and decided on global warming. And it is all about uh, an idea to reduce individual freedom, uh, to give governments more power, because uh, if in fact uh, we breathe carbon dioxide and that it's the lifeblood of everything we do, uh, we need a world government, we need stronger government at every level, and that's really what global warming is about. It's, it's not about the environment. But it's also about uh, eliminating fossil fuels, and certainly you've heard Scott say it uh, quite a few uh, times. I don't understand why anyone would want to eliminate a, an inexpensive fuel that is improving uh, the economy everywhere uh, it is being used. As we all remember, that we were supposed to run out of oil by the end of the century. Actually, a colleague of mine, a mentor of mine, uh, M. King Hubbard was the one in 1957 who predicted that we'd start going downhill in oil reserves by the mid-60s when we'd use more than we developed. He was wrong, but then people thought, well, he'll be right 10 years later. Uh, he was wrong, and they thought he would be right 10 years later until the shale uh, gas uh, boom began because someone figured out how to drill horizontally. We've been hydraulically fracturing wells. I sat on a well in Texas in 1961. First well we hydraulically fractured was in 1947. But it's only about 10 years ago that we figured out how to curve a steel pipe about uh, three degrees every hundred feet so that if we drilled down 3,000 feet we could make steel pipe turn a corner and go horizontally. And instead of fracturing a couple hundred feet of, of shale and getting improved gas and oil, we could go out 10, uh, well, two miles. We, we have wells that actually drill out uh, 10,000 feet. And, and so we're awash in, in shale gas. We have more of it in this country than anywhere in the world, far more. Colorado, which just voted down uh, a bill that would have uh, eliminated fracking in the state, has a single formation on the Green River that has more oil and gas reserves than all of Saudi Arabia. Our fuel is going to get cheaper and cheaper. I will make two predictions uh, here in my last couple of minutes. One is you will not see gasoline over $3 a barrel again in your lifetime for more than six months. You might see it for uh, a few weeks, but not in your lifetime for a period of six months. We have way too much of it. Scott and his friends want to replace fossil fuel with wind and solar. It's a nice idea. But wind and solar are not economical. And in all the wind turbines, and all the solar farms in the world, not a single fossil fuel power plant has been shut down as a result because they're, they don't run all the time. You have to have backup energy to save the grid and put them in place. Now, all of this is because they are predicting 100 years down the road that our climate will warm and it's going to be a bad thing. Now, they, they can't predict 10 years out, but they're trying to predict 100 years out. They say weather and climate are two different things. They are different. I mean, climate is an accumulation of weather. You all know, I think, how accurate your seven-day weather forecast is. Just slightly better than the flip of a coin, 56%. They want to change the world economy. And Scott's numbers of the reduction in gross national product, gross world product, are absolutely upside down. It will be a disaster if we don't eliminate the subsidies for wind and solar. That will happen. That will happen. I am very optimistic. The young people which buy into this seem to fear the future will not be as bright as the past. The future is always brighter than the past. Our greatest resources are be between our ears. We will figure out new and better things as we always do. Just go back 20 years in your life and remember what things you had to use in life and what you have today. It's, it's unimaginable. It always gets better. And I'll give you two, uh, I'll close with one terrific piece of, of good news that you're fearful of and another prediction that I can guarantee you will come true. The good news prediction is people are now worried about robots. You're going to lose your job. Young people aren't going to have jobs because robots are going to take over. 
I absolutely guarantee you that the use of robots will lead to all kinds of new jobs, all kinds of advancements in society. It will happen. Do not worry. And I'll close with my final prediction. As sure as I am, the future is always better than the past. At our next Earth Day, next April, people will stand up and offer new scenarios of gloom and doom. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was, uh, that was really something. You know, the easy part, uh, Dr. Denning and Dr. Lair, was uh, facing each other in a debate. Now comes the hard part, <laughs> facing our audience and their questions. And so uh, here in the audience, we have about 100 people in the room here tonight, and we have about uh, we have a couple hundred watching uh, at least online right now. And I have a couple of online questions all ready to go. But if you're here in the uh, in the space, you know it's it's obviously we're packed in pretty tight. We'll just put your hand up, and a Heartland staffer will come to you. Oh wow, already hands up, <laughs> and they'll come. Good, get in there early. They'll come to you with a microphone. They'll hold it in front of your face, uh, so you don't have to do anything but talk and even use your hands, because that's a lot of exciting things for everyone else. And uh, we'll just keep going. And uh, we actually ended a little bit early, which is a shock to me, because I've heard Jay Lair talk a lot. <laughs> but that actually gives us more time for Q&A, which is fantastic. Uh, so our first question that I present to our speakers tonight is from uh, Brad Belcaster. And this is from watching on Facebook. Um, it's actually for Dr. Denning, but uh, I'm sure you can both address it. If the Earth is getting too warm, what is the perfect global average temperature and mix of greenhouse gases that we must maintain to avoid catastrophic problems, and how do we do that? Well, certainly not up to me to recommend a perfect uh, temperature or perfect anything. Um, I think, really, we know that the Earth's temperature has changed a lot over time, over geologic time. The Earth's temperature has been much higher than it is now. It's been colder than it is now. Uh, what we're concerned about with regard to the economic damage of rapid climate change is that it changes very, very quickly, uh, more quickly than, than our uh, agriculture and our forests and our cities and our economy can adjust to it. So it's not so much uh, that I or anybody else would recommend a particular temperature, but rather that um, when, when big changes happen very quickly, um, it tends to be very disruptive of, uh, of the economy. I actually have a very precise answer to it. Uh, my wife of 25 years is uh, sitting here and she thought there should be some levity, so I will answer it seriously, but with a bit of levity because it uh, involves my ex-wife. My ex-wife was only happy at 73.6 degrees. Above or below, she was miserable. So that must be the perfect temperature for the world. And that's science, everybody, for sure. Uh, we have a question over here. And again, raise your hand. And it's, um, Ariana, you can go right over here uh, so you can be prepared for the next question. Uh, please identify yourself so that our speakers know to whom they're addressing. And uh, go ahead that the uh, temperature has been much warmer than it is now. Well, why was it much warmer than it is now? There, if, if man is causing it to increase now, there wasn't as much man, there was no industry when it was warmer, so what caused it, and why is now bad when then wasn't bad? So, the great question. Heat. Heat causes global warming. Man doesn't cause global warming. Heat causes global warming. So uh, similar global cooling is when heat is removed. So as heat is added to the earth, and this has happened over and over again over the course of geologic time, uh, the sun has brightened about 30% over the lifetime of the sun. Um, CO2 has come and gone over, over hundreds of millions of years. The continents have moved around and changed the, uh, the geography of the planet and uh, changed the ocean currents. Glaciers have come and reflected sunlight to space. Many, many natural changes long before humans came along. And in every single one of those changes, when heat, more heat was put into the earth than was taken out, it warmed up. And when more heat was taken out of the earth than was put in, it cooled off. So there's really uh, a wonderful story there about um, paleoclimate and about geology. 
I agree with absolutely everything Scott said for the first time tonight. Uh, but it also points out that we don't fully understand uh, the answer to your question is what uh, heats the earth. I mean, if we could uh, and we could measure the variables, we would be able to predict more accurately in the future. But uh, there are so many variables uh, that, that impact it. We don't fully understand them all. Uh, I think the sun is the most important one. Scott mentioned uh, it has uh, increased and it's varying all the time. In fact, I'll make another prediction that I hope most of you live to see. The sun has been through a, a dormant period in the last uh, 30 years, uh, greater than anything we've seen in a century. Uh, and uh, most climatologists feel there's a very good, or let's say many climatologists feel there's a good chance that in uh, 20 to 30 years we're going to be uh, entering a fairly serious cooling period. Not one that man can't acclimate to, but uh, I think global warming will discussion uh, in a couple decades. I have a question over here. Uh, yeah, George Clues. I'm with the Heartland Institute, but my area is education rather than environment. Um, going back to the beginning of the Al Gore movie where he was explaining global warming, I, I thought that was really good because uh, it showed the, the, uh, the sun's rays coming down and then uh, the, I guess the coming back as infrared and then the atmosphere, let's say it's like in this room, it's full of carbon dioxide. So then the carbon dioxide absorbs the, uh, the infrared and it gets warmer. So I would figure that the first thing that would get warm would be, li like if this room was the atmosphere, the atmosphere would get warm first. Uh, what, what has been the evidence uh, of warming in the atmosphere over the last uh, 30 or 40 years when we've had the the increase in uh, carbon dioxide so gr great question the atmosphere actually is warmed from the bottom which is an interesting thing just in general you know the sun is at the top you'd think maybe being on top of a mountain you'd be closer to the sun and be warm up there but it's not it's cold up there uh, the the sun's rays beat down on the ground the ground radiates up it's true that the co2 and the water vapor as uh, Jay mentioned and clouds absorb that infrared heat but they also emit heat so for example, if you go outside at night and there's no sun at all, there's about 300 watts per square meter coming down from the, from the warm sky that's being emitted down like a little infrared heat lamp uh, all the time, 24-7. You know, at, at night, there's no sun to, to get in the way. Um, so the actually, uh, the, the surface warms more than the atmosphere because of all this CO2 emitting <coughs> heat down to the surface. Um, the atmosphere has warmed, certainly, over the last 30, 40 years, um, and the surface is warm, but the, there's exchange, these photons travel at the speed of light between the two, uh, the two media. I have nothing to add. Okay, we have a question uh, over here. Um, my name is Catherine Blinsky, and I'm going to my second year in high school, and um, in my first year, we were studying in one of my classes about how in China, the, um, I believe Dr. Uh, Lair uh, said that um, some people want, want across the world wanted uh, to maintain birth uh, to a small smaller level than it really is, and um, they did that in China, and now they're experiencing the opposite of a baby boom, and in fact, there's uh, they're having problems uh, maintaining a natural amount of uh, children. And now they're actually paying more people to produce kids. So yes, so uh, that's a great uh, comment. Uh, China's in a heap of trouble. Uh, those people worry about uh, China eating our lunch. You can forget about it. We're going to be feeding them lunch, and it is a result of the one-child family. They got up to 1.3 billion people and thought it was a, a problem, and, and it was a problem. Uh, but they limited everyone to uh, one child. Uh, they now have. Uh, old people they can't take care of, they can't fill their factory floors. They have now rescinded the, uh, the policy, and I had uh, mentioned, the young lady pointed out that I had mentioned that David Brower in 1970 suggested the government require licenses to have children because he was so afraid that uh, too many children were going to uh, strip the world of all its resources. Uh, Julian Simon uh, wrote a, a fabulous book. He was a close friend of mine before his passing called The Ultimate Resource, and The Ultimate Resource is man's uh, brain power. Uh, the fascinating thing about China, it's going to take them a few generations to recover from having uh, 
uh, no increase in the population and young people because when they stopped you from having more than one child, lots of people decided they wouldn't have any children. And so the birth rate in uh, China is now 0.7. It takes 2.1 uh, children per uh, woman uh, to uh, balance or keep the ma and maintain uh, a population as stable. Uh, we uh, probably have the highest birth rate of any developed country in the world, but we're still uh, below 2.1. We're about uh, 1.96. Uh, the rest of the developed world is uh, in the order of 1.7, 1.8. Japan and Russia are both 1.2. So uh, we need people, and we're going to have a much bigger economic problem in uh, the coming decades as a result of declining population rather than the once thought of problem of overpopulation. We have a question back here in the, in the back of the room. Yes, yes. Uh, this is a question for, I think, for Dr. Denning. Um, you, you had several times uh, uh, the same plea, a plea for free market solutions. And I'm an economist, and I managed to be very confused because, because uh, free market solutions are, are to problems, are solving problems that individual people have, and people come together to work to solve problems that individual people have. And if global warming is a problem, then individual people would be deciding that. And a free market solution is not a government solution. And so you want a free market solution, but somehow I think you want government to take over the free market and make the solution work. So I couldn't really figure out what you try, what, were you, what you were pleading for. So, so I'm not sure that's a question. No, I couldn't uh, figure out. But I, I think I can uh, at least respond to your comment. So. Um, I think that uh, we can all agree that, uh, that free markets have produced a tremendous uh, amount of good things in the world. That, that um, when people freely buy and sell goods and services to one another, that uh, it adds value. That if I buy something from you for a dollar, and we both agree that it was a good deal, that actually more than a dollar's worth of value is, is created, that, that this is actually how money grows. In physics, we have conservation of mass and conservation of energy and conservation of water and things like that. You know, there's, there's only so much uh, energy in the world, but money isn't like that. Money actually grows over time because of, of uh, transactions, and, and this is a wonderful thing. So I, when I plead to you, the free market think tank, uh, I, I ask you for your ideas, to bring your ideas to this issue. Because if you don't, then we have a conversation that's really dominated by other people who aren't in this room, who aren't uh, part of that conversation. And I, I want to hear from you. I don't think it's not, it's not my need to hear from you. The world needs to hear from you. Okay, um, we have a question over here, this side of the room. Hi, I'm a retired economist from an oil, an oil company. And uh, this may shock you, but we at the oil company really liked high energy prices. <laughs> <laughs> and so this whole conspiracy theory about how the oil companies are conspiring with this global warming skeptics is really kind of far-fetched. But uh, I would like to make a personal comment about Churchill. Having been there and visited, I think you left out, not only are there polar bears in the region, but there are beluga whales. And the last I heard is that they're thriving. The best thing about Churchill is that you can get there on the train. Okay. <laughs> Please raise your hand and uh, Ariana will get you on this side of the room. I'm going to read another one from uh, online. We have people in the chat room on YouTube. And this is from uh, Rick Bartram. He says that CO2 has increased over the past 20 years, but temperature has not. Please explain why we should believe that CO2 is the critical component in our atmosphere controlling the climate. So the reason that we think that uh, CO2 affects temperature is because if you take some CO2 and shine infrared light through it, it absorbs the infrared light and warms up. 
So this is a laboratory measurement. Uh, it was first uh, done in 1863 by a scientist named John Tyndall. And since 1863, 150 years ago, the instruments have gotten better and better and better. Uh, we've gotten more and more precise about this measurement, but the answer really hasn't changed. We know for sure, there's no question at all, and I think Jay will agree with me, that CO2 absorbs infrared heat, in fact, at light, at, at 15 microns, exactly as he said. Um, now, not only in the lab, but outdoors you can measure this. I take my classes out and we, we measure uh, the heat coming down from, from the air, not from the sun, but just from the warm air uh, being emitted by CO2 molecules. You can measure it from satellites above, above the Earth, uh, measure the, the radiation coming out of that CO2. So uh, with regard to the question about um, in 20 years the CO2 has gone up and the temperature is not, uh, the CO2 has gone up a little bit in, in 20 years. Um, on the order of 10%. So nothing like a doubling of CO2. So it's perhaps a 10% increase in the CO2. And the temperature's gone up. Uh, the temperature has gone up uh, every decade since the 1970s, precisely as the physics uh, ex expects it to go up. I mean, this is, as I said, based on laboratory spectroscopy. I would uh, only disagree with the last uh, statement, satellite uh, temperature readings, which uh, many climatologists think are the most accurate, uh, would not agree that the temperature has uh, gone up each uh, year or each uh, decade. So it's a, a disagreement. We have a question here in the back, sir. Uh, Dennis Butterfast. My question is to Dr. Deming. A uh, number of times you made the statement that our society is not dependent on taking things from the earth. But yet, if you look around, everything that man, tangible, that man has created required taking something from the earth. I would like to know the basis of your statement. So I completely acknowledge that we take things from the earth. Uh, I was a geologist, actually uh, worked in the oil industry for a while when I first got out of college. Um, I, I take things from the earth. Um, my, my statement is that our society is not propped up by stuff that we take from here. There's a story out there that, um, that rings true to a lot of people. A lot of people on the left tell this story. That you dig a lump of coal from the ground and there's some, some value in that coal. And you set it on fire and it <coughs> makes heat and there's more value in the heat than there was in the coal. And you use that heat to boil water and there's more value in the energy in the boiled water than there was in, in the, in the heat and so forth and you you wheel and deal your way up until you have a 75 trillion dollar a year global economy based on this extraction and, and it's uh, essentially a multiplier effect uh, that starts with the with the rock and maybe that's true but I hope not I hope that's not really the way history works because if that's true then either some distant day when we run out of the stuff to dig up or when we decide to stop digging it up, we will find that our civilization was a house of cards. And it will fall down and our children and our grandchildren will go back to living the way our ancestors did in the Middle Ages. I don't want to believe that. I believe it comes from in here. I'm with Jay that the most valuable resource in our world is between our ears. It's our creativity, it's our ingenuity, and it's our willingness to do hard work. We make our world. I don't uh, disagree with that. However, uh, history has shown that we never run out of anything. Before we run out of anything, we figure out a better replacement. We didn't go from the Stone Age to the Steel Age because we ran out of stones. And uh, the, the, the famous bet between Paul Ehrlich and Julian Simon uh, 30 years ago, uh, Paul Ehrlich uh, was... Uh, charged by Simon, choose any uh, five natural minerals and uh, Simon uh, bet him that in 10 years, uh, collectively, a uh, given quantity of these uh, elements would be cheaper than they were the day of the bet. And uh, 10 years later, uh, Ehrlich had to uh, pay off. 
uh, we, we just figure out the, the sadness of my mentor, M. King Hubbard, was he was a brilliant petroleum engineer, but he saw a static world. He did not see the human mind as a resource. We will always be able to find replacements of things. Energy-wise, we may run out of uh, oil and, and shale gas in six or seven hundred years, and I don't think we can ever run out of nuclear energy, which will power the, the world for thousands and thousands of years beyond. We have a question right over here. Uh, my name is Bob Angelica. Every year it seems we get a press report from NASA or that other government agency, NOAA, that this year or last year was one of the warmest years on record and then the next year is the same story and the same story after that. How do we react to those stories? Uh, uh, are they taking at? I, I understand that there's a disagreement on how temperature measurements are taken. That some are in the ocean now next to ships and that may distort um, the, the readings and it's better from satellites. Could you both so, comment so on that? Uh, mm -hmm. it, it isn't quite every year that's warmer than, than uh, every previous year, but uh, <coughs> there have been a run of them in a row uh, of warmest years. Um, it's, it's, it's easy to make a measurement with a thermometer, but it's hard to correctly average the measurements of thousands and thousands of thermometers all over the world for 150 years. Uh, and a lot of work goes into that, and a lot of people have done that work. Um, there are other ways to measure temperature, or to estimate temperature, uh, and one of them that I know that Jay is fond of is, uh, is uh, essentially looking at the microwaves that are emitted by, by uh, the Earth, and um, you, you can try to use uh, computer models to calculate, estimate what the temperatures must have been that uh, caused those microwaves to get emitted. That's much more complicated than a thermometer. Uh, and those measurements are, are made above the atmosphere, you know, with, uh, with satellites, but of course we only have those for uh, about 30 years. We, we don't have those back 150 years. Um, I don't know what to tell you about what to make of them. Um, we put an awful lot of effort into making temperature measurements uh, and, and averaging them across the planet and publishing them every month of every year uh, for, for a long time. I have nothing to add. We have a question over here. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> My name is Terry Przbulski. Um I guess this is a little bit of a follow-up on what Jerry mentioned earlier, but uh, Dr. Deming, you mentioned the need to propose more free market solutions to this problem that we are alleged to have. But it seems to me that every statement that I have ever heard from Mr. Gore or Mr. Obama or Mrs. Clinton or anyone else who advocates for this issue has indicated that they believe that the only permissible solutions involve vastly more government spending and taxation and regulation and widespread restrictions on all kinds of individual private activities. So what evidence do we have that they would be willing to accept any free market solutions in the first place? Well, so I'm going to come back to my, uh, you know, I'm an atmospheric scientist, not a politician thing. Um, don't think I can, I can uh, solve that for you, but I think that it's a mistake for advocates of free market solutions to just give up. I think it's, it's actually incumbent on people who have other ideas to bring your best ideas to this problem. This is one of the central issues of our time. We need your wisdom. We need a balanced conversation about this. If, if you want this to be completely handled by people whose politics you don't agree with, you're doing a great job. Nothing to add, Jay Lair. Nope. Okay. All right. Well, I have a question here from, uh, from online. And by the way, on, in the chat room, it's, uh, it's interesting. Somebody said it's a nice, interesting debate, and it's civil. And I'd have to agree that you know, the debate isn't over. And when you have one, it can be uh, informative, civil, and even entertaining. Um, there's a question from Danny S. in the chat room. 
uh, how would the Heartland Institute solve environmental problems that are caused not by taking into account external costs, that are caused by not taking into account external costs, not just for climate change but for any other pollution issue? And I think that I asked that, or I picked that question because I think it, it gets to something you were talking about, Dr. Denning, is like we need the ideas. Uh, you know, Heartland Institute, we're a free market think tank. Um, there's a movement called free market environmentalism. And uh, let's talk about that a little bit. What are the free market solutions? Is that, and if anybody says a carbon tax, you're getting thrown out of here. <laughs> well, uh, I've been with uh, Heartland for 20 years and helped to uh, publish environment and climate news. And we deal with every environmental uh, issue that comes along. And we try to sort out our primary audience, our elected state officials and often uh, city officials. And we just try to print objective information about what climate issue, what the truth is, what the fiction is, and uh, whether action uh, is needed. So, of course, climate has been uh, a major issue of ours. We've just published uh, volumes and volumes of material in the newspaper and in books as well. And uh, we have to conclude that it simply is not a, a serious problem. We have concluded that on a uh, number of environmental issues and on other issues, uh, we've taken a very strong uh, position. So uh, our job is to sort out what needs action and what we think uh, does not uh, need action. All right, hey, a little more. There you go. <laughs> Questions. I guess one is somewhat facetious, but do you know if Al Gore realizes that humans exhale carbon dioxide? Pretty sure he does, yeah. <laughs> I disrespectfully. I, I think Al Gore is uh, one of the smartest people uh, around. Uh, help us. I didn't used to think that. He roomed with uh, Tommy Lee Jones at Harvard. I was sure that Tommy Lee did his homework. Eventually, uh, Mr. Gore. He was thrown out of uh, Harvard eventually, I think uh, ended up at, uh, at Vanderbilt, but I used to think he's dumb. Uh, he's anything but. He's smart as a fox. And I last I looked, he'd made at least uh, $400 million on the uh, global warming scam. That's smart as a fox rather than, you know, being correct. Yeah. Uh, the other part, the other question. Sir, I can you please let her hold the microphone because you keep moving away from your face. <laughs> it's hard All to right. hear. Um, what was the uh, explanation for the heat spike of the 1930s? The uh, heat spike in the 1930s, the Dust Bowl in the United States, was primarily a regional phenomenon, not a global phenomenon. So this was uh, a, a, an interaction of feedback between uh, drought, which got started probably because of uh, changes in the ocean, that dried out a big area in the middle of the United States, uh, as the crops died and the grass withered, the sunshine beats down. Normally, a lot of the sunshine, in fact, about uh, three quarters of the energy from the sunshine at the surface is used to evaporate water. But when you don't have water to evaporate, all that energy from the sun goes into heating the air. Build up a great big heat dome over the, uh, the middle of the United States, and incoming um, rainstorm systems would divert around that heat dome and it kind of locked in this horrific uh, dust bowl condition. These things happen um, periodically, these, these uh, regional droughts that, that get amplified like that by the interaction between soil moisture and, and precip. Um, terrible thing. Thank you. I guess we should be glad for I, uh, that was a phenomenal explanation. Uh, I have a rule in my life. I try to go to bed every night smarter than I woke up in the morning, and Scott just supplied me with some new knowledge. Thank you. <laughs> Terrific. We have a question over here. Yeah, my name is John Mealy. Um, basically, what's causing the ice to melt like the North and South Pole? What's, caus what's causing the ice melting? Is that caused by, um, I mean, a global warming in, in, in Antarctica and in the South or North Pole, the ice melting? Well, the... As we go through historically temperatures, uh, we've had ice uh, melting and freezing in the Arctic. There is no question whatsoever. We're in a period now where there is Arctic melting and there are more glaciers melting than are accreting. However, there's many, many times more ice 
uh, in the Antarctic uh, than in the Arctic, and <coughs> the total amount of ice uh, in the Antarctic is uh, is free is uh, is growing. Uh, I don't know that we uh, totally uh, understand it, and Scott has explained how complicated it is, you know, to go back uh, historically and figure out what caused uh, heat spikes and, and so on. I mean, that's what Scott does pretty much every day of his life as a climate scientist, try to figure these things out. So let's talk about the Arctic. Uh, in the Arctic, it, it's ocean up there. The, what the ice in the Arctic is floating sea ice on top of, the, on top of a great big deep ocean. Uh, in the Antarctic, it's land ice. It's, it's a giant ice sheet three miles thick on top of the South Pole. But in the Arctic, it's sea ice. So it's a, there's a lot less ice to melt. The, whole, the ice thickness, uh, even the greatest ice thickness you ever see up there is about as thick as this room is tall. So it doesn't really take that much to melt it. You put all that CO2 in the air, it's absorbing the outgoing heat, it's radiating down on the, on the ice, that warms it up. As the ice melts, it exposes the dark water, which soaks up the sun, where the ice was real reflective and, you know, sun just bounces right off the ice. But when you have open water, it soaks up the sun. That makes it uh, melt even more. The other thing that uh, we've recently begun to understand better is that all that open water up there evaporates like crazy into the atmosphere. And as Jay said, water vapor is a big greenhouse gas. So that adds to the greenhouse effect over the Arctic. Having all that extra evaporated water from the open water where the ice has melted also makes clouds up there. All of you know, uh, like uh, all of us being equal on a, on a clear night, it's colder than it is on a cloudy night. And so you get all those extra clouds up there and that warms it up too. So, it's, so again, kind of like the uh, dust bowl problem that we talked about before this is an amplification where things kind of feed back. Sir, right here is a question. Yes, mine is uh, is really a business question. I um, I work with uh, business leaders, and so help me. Why are so many leading businesses today supporting the UN, the Obama climate program? You know, Unilever, General Mills, Target, a whole long list of corporations are supporting uh, the, this program. And it troubles me. I try and argue with some of your materials. And, uh, you know, Stephen Moore was featured here uh, recently in his book, Fueling the Economy. We ought to be growing at 4% if we use fossil fuel and so on. We're only growing, in, uh, you know, terribly. It's worse since 1949. So how do we reach the corporate community? Why are they giving into this? I don't think we'll ever reach the corporate community because they're uh, wanting to apply favor with government. The, if you went through the Fortune 500, just as you described, I'm sure you'd find 450 of the 500 are exactly as you say. They fall in line with the administration because uh, I think they have the wrong, the wrong idea that if they agree with the administration, they support the administration, the administration will go easier on them when they need something uh, more important to their business. It is crony capitalism. Uh, I think Wall Street is in bed with the, uh, the government. It's, uh, it's, it's a terrible part of capitalism that really uh, uh, needs to be ended, and uh, that kind of tells you uh, what side of the election I am on, because uh, one side... Uh, I, <laughs> I don't know. Can we be political? But no, I no, mean, no, no. But uh, I, I know Hillary has gotten two hundred fifty thousand dollars for speaking twenty minutes to a number of Wall Street uh, firms. So uh, uh, they uh, they know what they're doing in spending that money and a, that yeah. <laughs> And and uh, it was in the front page of the paper today. They're trying to get the whole Clinton family uh, to separate themselves from the Clinton Foundation, which has raised umpteen uh, billions of dollars uh, by uh, pay for play. But I think the real answer to your question is pay for play. Uh, if you agree, go along with the administration. They'll go easy on you. I've never seen it happen. I think it's wrongheaded and a mistake, but that's uh, the only thing I can think of. I used to think business would all be uh, for what made sense for the public. Uh, now I realize it's what makes sense for their bottom line. Anything to add? Anything about Hillary you want to add, to Scott? <laughs> No? Not touching that one. <laughs> appreciate that. I, I would appreciate $200,000, though, for <laughs> speaking here. <laughs> we'll talk later. Uh, we, we have time for uh, two more questions here. Um, Ma'am, over here on the right. Yes, um, I'd like to thank Dr. Denning for um, suggesting 
fact that we would like to have new ideas and more discussion and debate. But unfortunately, what I see is people that do have differing views, scientists especially, are shut out of the debate if they do not agree with the government policy that has been promoting the climate change. And how do we get others to want to debate like you would like? Thank you for the suggestion. Thank you for your thoughts. Um, I go to a lot of, uh, of scientific conferences and meetings and so forth, as you might imagine. Um, also work at a university and uh, have conversations with my colleagues and with my students. Um, it's, it's awful when people shut each other down. And I always want to promote people reaching out and talking to each other. I, I think it was great that this uh, fellow in the back, the economist, wanted to, to talk to me about, uh, teach me some, some economics. That's great. You know, I'm, I'm an atmospheric scientist. I, I don't, I don't uh, have expertise there. I'm just reading, uh, learning as, as I go. And I think events like this are, are a good thing. I think it's great when we talk to each other, when we exchange some ideas, uh, when we can be civil. Oh, yeah, you're reminding me, I gotta hold the microphone closer, sorry. I, I talk with my hands, it's a problem. All right. All right, we have, uh, we have time for uh, one more question over here on the left. Yeah, hi, David Perenboom. Um, I wonder if you guys are aware of some studies I've read about in the past on uh, uh, botanical things where they're growing photosynthetic synthetic plants, photosynthesis, yeah, um, uh, under controlled conditions where they'll raise the CO2 level. And what they found, I understand, correct me if I'm wrong, is that the plants basically flourish. They got more food. And so it's sort of a negative feedback system where, you know, you get more, more CO2, but more is sequestered by the growth of green plants, as long as we don't cut down all the rainforests and things. So, absolutely right. Thanks. That's actually kind of my specialty. Is uh, is this particular issue is what I what I do my research on. Um, without a doubt, if you go down to like a microscopic scale and you put more CO2 around a chloroplast uh, from a leaf, it will it will photosynthesize more. Um, however. Uh, when, when you get out at sort of large scale, like a, a whole forest instead of just a chloroplast, um, it isn't enough to just have more photosynthesis because that tree winds up, you know, dropping leaves in the fall and eventually dying. What you have to do to, to get the negative feedback is actually have stuff growing faster than it's dying. So the more stuff you have, the more, you know, biomass you have in the forest, uh, the more leaves you drop in the fall and the more dead would you start building up on the forest floor and stuff. Uh, but it actually does appear that over the last 50 years, since we've really had good data on this, this is actually happening. That the extra CO2 in the atmosphere has actually caused plants to grow faster than they're dying worldwide, which is a remarkable thing. And it's uh, up to about a quarter of the fossil fuel emissions are being uh, removed from the atmosphere by this by this mechanism that you've described. So it's a it's a fantastic thing. Uh, we, what I always tell my students is, my job is to figure out how that works, where it's happening, uh, is it going to stop someday? Is there anything we can do to keep it keep it going? Okay. Actually, I have, I have one more question I wanted to get from online, and if you could address it, each of them in 60 seconds, if you know from your research or your stuff. Yeah, sure. I'm sure you can. <laughs> but, you know, scientists are so certain that CO2 is driving current warming, um, but how do scientists explain what caused the previous medieval warm period and also uh, what brought on the Little Ice Age? So we've had those kind of climactic things. What, have, what has caused those? So I come back to my same old story, and you're probably getting tired of hearing me say it, but uh, heat. Heat causes warming, right? More heat in minus heat out equals change of heat, and change of heat is change of temperature. Medieval warm period was, uh, the, the sun was a little tiny bit brighter for a period of centuries in there, and there was a few fewer uh, volcanic eruptions that reflected sun back out to space from those volcanic ash clouds. Uh, the Little Ice Age, the opposite. The, the sun dimmed out, I mean, we're talking like tenths of a watt per square meter, and uh, 
more volcanoes for a period of uh, from about the 1300s through the 1500s in there. Um, so these tiny little changes, tenths of a watt per square meter, all it takes to, to make these climate changes happen. Uh, we're talking 10 times that much change for doubling a CO2. Well, as I said before, uh, it's been a delight to uh, debate with uh, Scott, and, and he has uh, taught me a great deal. The one thing he has not taught me in any way is that uh, man is causing any change whatsoever in the planet's temperature, that it's a crisis, and that we need to do anything about it. In fact, what we need to do is stop worrying about it and start uh, looking at the problems of mankind, which are bringing electrification to a billion uh, people who don't have it on the planet, bringing better sanitation, bringing better water supplies. Each, uh, every other year in Copenhagen, uh, there is a consensus uh, brought together of uh, economists from all over the world, and they rate the problems of the world and where you can get the most bang for your buck trying to solve the world's problems. Uh, for the last uh, 10 years, there have been about 17 issues that they deal with, and most of them deal with uh, medicine, health care, and sanitation, and uh, food supply, and water supply, and each and every year, uh, concern for global warming, uh, getting anything out of a dollar spent, uh, has always landed at the bottom, and that's exactly where I think it belongs. Thank you. Yep, yes, a round of applause. Th thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, you're, you're living proof that the debate over the causes and consequences of climate change is not, in fact, over. So we appreciate that. Uh, thank you all for, uh, for being here tonight. I really appreciate, we all appreciate you being here. Uh, and how about a round of applause for the staff of the Heartland Institute to help bring this room together. And, and thank you to everybody who was watching online. That was uh, very spirited. Uh, before you go, you should all see on your tables uh, this flyer here. So our, the, the Heartland Institute's 32nd anniversary benefit dinner is uh, Thursday, September 15th at the Cotillion, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, nearby here in Palatine, Illinois. Um, you will be able to sign up for this. I think you might even be able to pay through credit card uh, before you leave. You will, uh, so that's great. So please take this opportunity. It is starting to sell, it's getting close to sell out. So if you wanna come, now's the time to get your tickets so that you can attend uh, this fantastic um, event at the Heartland Institute. And of course, just a reminder that uh, the new book, Why Scientists Disagree About Global Warming, which explains a lot of our side of this debate tonight. Uh, and along, it, it's, um, it's a new second edition, but a new forward. You can get that uh, special price tonight for $10, and we hope you'll grab some of those for yourself and for your friends. Once again, thank you so much for being here tonight. I'm, I hope you enjoyed yourself, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>